Thank you very much, Claudine. Um, thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, and I'm glad to have a topic to talk about, which um, does indeed, as you'll see, have a connection to Paris. Um, the first part um, I, I'm going to go through very quickly. I, I, I think much of it will be familiar to most of you. It's some of the standard arguments from the, um, the, the history and philosophy of quantum mechanics over the last 80 years or so. Um, let's start in 1935 with the famous einstein podolsky rosen argument. einstein podolsky and Rosen consider a particular kind of experiment in which two particles are prepared and then sent off in opposite directions. In their version, it wasn't photons, as it is here, but this is a, a later version of the experiment invented by David Bohm, I think, in the early 50s. What einstein podolsky and Rosen argued, or used this kind of experiment to argue, was that quantum mechanics, as it was standardly presented in 1935, was incomplete, that there must be further facts about the world not described in the standard quantum theory. Their argument, um, to, to summarize it very briefly, was that in cases like these, we find a perfect correlation between the results of certain experiments which can be made on each side. And the experimenters on each side have a, have a choice as to which measurements to make, indicated by the fact that there are these two paths with question marks. The point is, if they make the same choice, there's a perfect correlation between the results they find. And uh, Einstein and his collaborators argued that since, and we'll come this, to this assumption in a moment, since what Alice chooses over here can't have any effect on the reality of, over there, in the case in which, say, Alice measures the, makes the left-hand measurement, she can predict with certainty what the result of a, a similar measurement by Bob would be. And so EPR argued that there must be some element of reality, as they called it, already existing on Bob's side, not described by the quantum formalism in order to um, explain um, that prediction made with certainty. OK, but the argument assumed this principle they called locality. That is, roughly speaking, that there's no action at a distance from Alice to Bob, or vice versa. So no, nothing Alice does can affect the reality instantaneously on the other side of the experiment. These, in principle, these, experiment, these experiments can be as far apart as we like. And that seemed entirely uncontroversial at the time. As Schrodinger put it in that year, measurements on separated systems cannot directly influence each other. That would be magic. So that's 1935. Now we move on to 1964, where when Bell famously <coughs> proved, or seemed to prove, that, as we might put it, magic happens in quantum mechanics. So what Bell showed, or is taken to have shown, is that in experiments of this kind, it's in, in fact impossible for them to find a local hidden variable theory which is compatible with all the predictions that quantum theory makes about these experiments. And the, the extra step that Bell took was to look not just at the correlations when Alice and Bob make the same measurement, but at the correlations that hold when they make different measurements. There's, there's some discussion about exactly what Bell's theorem proves, and, and that's not really going to be relevant for present purposes. Uh, I, th I think the, the, the standard reading is something like this. The standard reading is that Bell has shown that the quantum world is unavoidably non-local, that there is some kind of subtle action at a distance in the quantum world. Here's a, a, a summing up of that viewpoint from a recent piece by David Albert and, um, and Rivka Galchin in Scientific American. They say quantum mechanics has upended many in intuition, but none deeper than locality or the principle of no action at a distance. And this particular upending, they say, carries with, it, carries with it a threat as yet unresolved to special relativity, a foundation stone of our 20th century, 21st century physics. Okay, so that's 1964. And that brings me to the Parisian element. As I said, in assuming the principle of locality, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen had relied, in effect, on the principle of no action at a distance. 
But in the late 1940s, a young Parisian graduate student, shown here with his advisor, here he is on the right, this is his advisor, Louis de Broglie, um, he spotted a loophole in the einstein podolsky rosen argument. He saw that Alice's choices on one side of the experiment could affect Bob's particle and vice versa without action at a distance if the effect was allowed to follow a zigzag path via the past. Okay, so here he is, um, Olivier Costa de Beauregard, um, who died a few years ago. Um, here he is again with a, a young admirer, in, I, think this was, I think this was 2005, a couple of years before he died. Um, I, I went out to see him uh, outside Paris with my young colleague, um, Guido Bacigalupi, who many of you will know, uh, he, and he and his wife very kindly gave us lunch and we had a very, a very interesting conversation about the history of quantum mechanics. And here's a diagram from one of his papers about this. His first paper was published in 1953. I asked him when we had lunch, I asked him when he, I knew the first paper was in 1953, I, I asked him when he'd actually had the idea. And he said, well, back in, in the late 40s when I was working with De Broglie, he said, De Broglie thought it was crazy and wouldn't let me publish it until Feynman published a famous paper which treated positrons as being electrons going backwards in time. And then you know, De Broglie said, well, look, there's this clever young American publishing this kind of crazy stuff. Perhaps you should go ahead and publish as well. Which he did. There's, there's one paper from 1953. And then I think nothing until perhaps the 1970s. And this diagram comes from one of the papers in the 1970s. This is the caption from the paper. Space-time diagram of the Einstein paradox. It's the EPI argument. The correlation between L and N, that's where I have Alice and Bob, is tied through C in their common past via the Feynman-style zigzag made of the time-like vectors CL and CN. So that, that's the thought. That's what I'm calling the Parisian zigzag. Okay. Um, now, Costa de Beauregard apparently thought of this argument as an, an objection to um, Einstein. He thought of it as a move on Bohr's side in the argument between um, Einstein and Bohr. The reason he thought of it like that, obviously, was he saw it as undermining the assumption of locality. And so in that sense, it is, an, it is a move against the Einstein argument. But it can't undermine the conclusion of the Einstein argument because the zigzag isn't there in standard quantum mechanics. So if we want to put it in, we need some hidden variables to represent it. And so you can only make this move if you're prepared to accept with Einstein that quantum mechanics is incomplete. Okay, but the interesting thing about it, the really interesting thing about it, is not the relevance so much to the original EPR argument, it's the, relevant to, it's the relevance to Bell's argument, because it may well be the, uh, the key to saving locality, that is, to avoiding action at a distance in the light of Bell's result. Um, Bell's argument simply assumes that Alice's choice of measurement setting doesn't influence the prior state of the photon, and, and similarly for Bob. So, so it assumes that the choice that Alice makes here as to what kind of measurement to make on the photon doesn't have any influence on the state of the photon in that period before it gets to um, that measuring device. So that's, in effect, a, a no retroprosality assumption. It's often called the independence or something like that. And the, the Bell correlations are easy to explain in principle if, if we allow such retrocausality, that is, if we allow the, the Parisian zigzag. So in effect, then, we can save locality, that is, save the principle of no action to distance, and the tension with relativity simply disappears. So in the light of that, why isn't the Parisian zigzag more popular and better known. Why do I have to be here in 2013 telling you about it? Why hasn't this been obvious for 50 years? Well, it may in part be due to Bell himself. Here's John Bell. Here's his views about retrocausality and back causation. 
And this is from a letter he wrote to me in, as you see, 8th of June, 1988. 25 years, is that right? Yeah, 25 years. Um, I wrote to Bell, sending him a couple of my early uh, and um, rather inelegant papers about this, and he very kindly wrote back. Fortunately, it was in the, the days before email, so, so I have this handwritten letter from Bell. Uh, and he says, I have not myself been able to make any sense of the notion of backward causation. When I try to think of it, I lapse quickly into fatalism. It's always seemed to me that that was, rather than that being the end of the matter, it was the beginning of the matter. Because if, if physicists are lapsing into fatalism, that's a clear sign that they need some more help from philosophers. <laughs> because, of course, philosophers are used to helping students who, who, who lapse into fatalism in first-year metaphysics lectures. Okay, so, so, so that was Bell. I think other people have lapsed that way too. You still find lots of people talking about the no direct causality principle as a free will principle, as if giving it up would involve some sort of tension with free will. The other common responses you get, well, people say, show me a model. Uh, and perhaps most interesting, you get the claim that retrocausality would involve retro-signaling and hence lead to the usual kind of time travel paradoxes. But later on, I wanted to show you that we, we, we can do something to respond to both of those points, especially the second one. We can see why the kind of retrocausality um, required by the Parisian zigzag it can be explicitly shown not to lead to signaling. So I'll come to that in the third part of the talk. But before that, what I want to do is to present what I think is a new argument for retrocausality in quantum mechanics, a different argument, not, not the argument which flows through Bell's theorem. And what's more, it's an argument which could in principle have been discovered much earlier, because it could in principle have been discovered, in fact, 30 years before the EPR argument, because all it depends on is the quantization which was discovered by Einstein in 1935. Well, it depends on some other assumptions as well, but they're assumptions which, as I'll explain later, would have been taken for granted by Einstein in, in, in 1905. I think I said 1935. I mean, 19, 1905, when, when Einstein <laughs> discovered, or, or took himself to have discovered that light was quantized. I think it's true to say that almost nobody believed him for 15 years. I think for 15 years, Einstein was basically alone in believing that in some real sense, Light was quantized. Okay, but that's that's really what the um, new argument depends on. So let's run through the argument. And it, one of the things I want to use it to do is to contrast the classical treatment of a certain kind of experiment with the quantum treatment, and show how the the new feature, the feature which implies retrocausality, arises from the quantum features of the experiment. This is, that thing is a polarizing crystal. That is, it's a, it's a crystal which has the property that if you shine a beam of polarized light at it, it will split that beam into two beams. One beam polarized at the same angle as the crystal is oriented, and the other polarized at right angles to that. You know, or, ordinary polarizing lenses that you have in your sunglasses, they, they do something similar, but instead of reflecting the second beam out that way, they simply absorb it. But a, a polarizing crystal splits a beam of polarized light into two. And there's a mathematical expression for the intensity of the two beams in terms of the difference between the ang initial angle of polarization of the incoming beam, which is tau, and the angle at which the crystal is oriented here depicted as sigma r. And this is called Marlis's law. And it says that the, the intensity of the transmission beam, this one that goes straight through, is given by cos squared, um, it, it, cos squared of the difference between the, the angles, and the remaining proportion, the sine squared portion, that goes that way. Um, was Marlis French? I think he's an early 19th century physicist. I have an idea he might be French. Is that? Marlis. 
And anyway, let's, uh, somebody can tell us that later. Um, okay, so that's, part, that's half of the experiment. Here's the other half, which is, in effect, the same thing operating in reverse. So in classical electromagnetism, it's, um, it's a thoroughly time-symmetric theory. So in principle, you can use one of these polarizing crystals to combine two light beams. You have to be pretty careful about setting it up right. You have to get the phases of the two beams right. But if you do that, you can combine two beams into a single beam. And the expression for the intensity of the two beams and the various angles involved, again, it, it's, it's Malus's law. Um, as I say, the theory is time symmetric, so that's exactly what you'd expect. OK, so now what we want to do is to put the, those two pieces of apparatus together. So in effect, we want to take light beams in here, um, let the beam travel across to the, to the right-hand polarizing crystal, and then have, have the, that crystal split it again. A couple of remarks about that. One is I just want to call your attention to the fact that it's extremely natural, especially natural, I think, in an audience like this, to think of the polarization as a local mechanism, something that carries influence from this side to this side. It's easy to use this device as a, a kind of signaling or, or control device where variations made over here produce variations in the polarization, which in turn make things happen over there. So in that case, if that's how it's set up, all your intuitions about causation needing a mechanism are going to tell you that the polarization is exactly that mechanism in these cases, because that's the thing that, that varies. OK, but what, the other thing I want to say is just about what we're going to be thinking about, about this apparatus. What we're going to be thinking about is what we can control if the only things that we can control are the polarizer angles on the left or the right. So that's the case in which we're, as we're making changes, wiggling the, the polarizer angle here. That's the case in which we're making changes over here. And we're going to think about those cases independently. OK, so first of all, the left-hand case. Suppose we control the, the angle of this polarizer. I, I put the knob on the diagram to, to, to make it obvious how we control it. We, we just reach up there and turn that knob. Um, but we don't control the input beams. So let's suppose that the input beams are controlled by one of these demons who turn up in physics occasionally. This one is called the demon of the left. Here he is. Question. If the demon of the left is controlling the input intensities and knows, I mean, of course, he can see what setting we choose here. Who controls, who controls the polarization of the beam? Or is it the demon, is it us, or is it in some sense a mix between the two? Well, it turns out that the answer is the demon has complete control. Um, so whatever angle we choose here, the demon can produce whatever polarization he likes by choosing appropriate input intensities. One way to see what input intensities the demon needs is just to imagine that the polarizer setting is the same on that side. Consider the output intensities that nature produces on that side, and those will be the input intensities that the demon needs on that side. Again, from the time symmetry of the whole setup. And really what the demon is doing here is behaving on the left just the way in which <coughs> nature behaves on the right. That's the role of the demon in this argument. So the demon can counteract our wiggles, um, and we have no control over the polarization. You see, here I am moving that knob, but as you can see, the polarization isn't changing. OK, so what about on the right? Um, again, let's suppose we control the right polarizer angle, but not the output beams. Here's nature controlling those. It's sort of not coincidental that nature is both a cat and something macroscopic like a bus. That's a sort of vague allusion to the quantum case which we're coming to. Um, can we control the input polarization here by, by moving that knob? Well, in this case, our intuitions tell us, no, that's crazy. That would be backward causation. Of course we can't do that. And it's nice to have that confirmed by the physics. So if, 
if I make a change here, what's happening is that nature is changing the um, intensities on those two output beams and the polarization isn't changing. So there's, there's no retrocausality in this classical case. Okay, this probably comes as a relief. It'd be surprising if it had been lurking there uh, for, you know, since the, the, the mid-19th century or even earlier, Malus, beginning of the 19th century. Okay, now let's think of the quantum case. Here we have a quantum version of Malus's law, exactly the same as the classical version, except we've replaced the intensities by probabilities, and that's because we can see, feed in a single photon here. Uh, the photon's not going to get split between the two beams. It's going to, if we set up measuring devices, we're going to find it coming out one way or the other. Um, and Malus's law now gives us the probabilities for the two possible outcomes. Um, and again, if we're careful, we can have a, a time reverse version of Malus's law on the left-hand side. Here we need to be very careful about what we mean by probability, because it's probability of something in the past. Um, but if, if we're careful, we, we can do that. If anyone wants to raise that in discussion, we could talk about it. Okay, so again, we can consider the apparatus where we put, two, put the two halves of the experiment together. Again, I just want to emphasize that it's natural to think of, I'll explain a bit later why I've now put a subscript L on the polarization. But I, I just want to um, encourage you to agree with me that it's very natural to, still to think of polarization as a local mechanism. Um, to think of it as whatever piece of reality connects changes on the left to changes on the right. This term beable comes from John Bell. Um, Bell says that he'll call something a beable if it's a bit of the theory which is supposed to correspond to a bit of reality. And the point I'm making is that it's very natural to think of, in, in the quantum case as in the classical case, to think of polarization as a bit of reality. But um, just because I want to make my assumptions explicit, I'm, I'm going to introduce a name for the assumption that um, polarization should be thought of as a beable, as a bit of reality. One reason for doing that is because, of course, in quantum foundations these days, there are plenty of people who would deny that. People who will deny that quantum mechanics really has anything to say about reality between measurements. But I'm, I'm not speaking to those people. I want to make my assumptions explicit, and so I'm going to call that assumption realism. And again, we're going to be thinking about what happens if we can just wiggle the, one of the polarizer settings. Okay, again, looking at the left case first, suppose we control the left polarizer sigma L, but not the input beams. Again, we've got the demon of the left controlling those. Can we control the polarization? Remember, in the classical case, the answer was no. The demon had complete control. Here, the answer is a kind of qualified yes. And the main part of the qualification is that it's yes as long as the demon has to put the photon on one channel or the other. I call that the discreteness assumption. And I want to make the point here for any physicist present that I, I'm aware that it may not be a physically realistic assumption because real physicists would know how to feed in a superposition on those two channels, and in that case the discreteness assumption doesn't hold. Okay. But what I'm interested in is um, what follows when it does hold, um, and for example, I think you, you, most physicists would say that it does hold if you put a which way detector on the two channels so you know which way it came in, so that you don't control it, but when the demon makes his choice, you know which way it's coming. In this case, there are only two possible... In this case, once, once we've made our choice of sigma L here, there are only two possible values for the polarization. It can either be equal to sigma L, or it can be equal to sigma L plus pi on 2, plus 90 degrees. So that means that although we can't fix sig uh, tau L completely, we can restrict it to just two possibilities. And that's a whole lot more control than we had in the classical case. And where it's coming from, of course, is the fact we've got this continuously valued variable here, this knob. The discreteness assumption means that the, the demon only has two options. So um, the demon just doesn't have enough options to counteract the wiggles that we can make here. 
Um, okay, and so uh, I, I've introduced this symbol to represent, you see, we, 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 we can't control which way the polarization goes exactly, but we can control it up to 90 degrees. The point of this symbol is to, um, what it means in effect is that the polarization goes that way or it goes that way, but we don't know which. And now you can see that as I move the knob, I'm changing that which, given realism, is changing something real about the photon. And there's nothing the, there's nothing the demon can do about that. So there's this new kind of control that we get from this discreteness assumption, from the assumption that the, the photon has to be on one channel rather than the other. As far as I know, nobody has actually... I mean, it's not a very deep point, but as far as I know, nobody's actually pointed it out before. And so um, I'm tempted to call this new kind of control price control. If you forgive me the immodesty for the sake of the pun. Um, OK, so that's the left-hand case. But the case that really interests us is the right-hand case. And this is a case in which we control the right polarizer, but not the output beams. Here's nature controlling those. Question is, can we control some property? Let's call it tower of the input beam. And here the answer turns out to be yes on two further assumptions. Remember, the, the existing assumption is realism. One is the discreteness assumption that we had in the demon case. So we have to assume that nature is putting the output channel at the output photon on one channel or the other. And the other is time symmetry. And time symmetry tells us that if tau L exists with, with certain sorts of rules relating to the stuff on the left-hand side, then a corresponding property tau R must exist standing in the co corresponding relation to the stuff on the right-hand side. Um, an intuitive way to think of this, an intuitive way to think of time symmetry in general in physics is in terms of the question as to whether if you have a video of a process, you can tell whether the video is being played forwards or backwards. Now, we can't, we can't literally make videos of photons, of course, but we can easily make computer simulations of what we take the ontology to be, and we can ask the same question about those. The point is that if it weren't true that there was some property tau r, which was the, the sort of mirror image of tau l, then those, in those videos it would be very easy to tell which way the video was being played. So that's, that's why time symmetry requires that something, that, that, that tau r, that the kind of temporal mi mirror image of tau l exists. In the classical case, the same thing, the same thing you can use the same one at both ends. So there's no problem there. Time symmetry holds. Uh, but here, as I'll explain in a moment, they have to be different. So if you've got that tau r, then again, um, there's just two possible values for it. It can be either equal to the sigma r, the setting of this polarizer, or it can be that plus pi on 2. So again, we can't fix it completely, but we can restrict it to just two possibilities. And now you see, as I'm moving that knob, I'm changing some real property of the photon in the past. So that's retrocausality. This is why it has to be a different property because, of course, if, I'm, if I can control both polarizers, then I can set, set them at angles which are not at 90 degrees to one another, and then clearly the thing I control from the left has to be different from the thing I control from the right. Okay, so what that argument shows is that if we combine the three assumptions, realism, time symmetry, and the one I call discreteness, then together they imply retrocausality. So we've got a, a choice. We have to reject at least one of the principles on the left, or we have to reject the principle that causation only works forwards. What are we going to do at this point? Well, we're going to ask the man in the street for some advice. Here's the man in the street. <laughs> it's the wrong street, actually. This is, this is Berlin in 1932. We should have got him in, where was it, Berlin in, in 1905. But it's harder. It's, he was less photographed in, in those days. OK, but let's ask him. Which one should go? Realism 
time symmetry, discreteness, or the principle that we can't affect the past. Well, it's obvious that, that Einstein was a realist about quantum theory. That was the whole point in 1935, after all. It's very clear that in, in um, around 1905, the years after that, he would have um, accepted time symmetry. There's a famous um, debate between Einstein and a, a colleague called Ritz about 1909, where, in effect, what Einstein is doing is precisely sticking up for the principle of fundamental time symmetry and for the principle that all the apparent time asymmetry associated with thermodynamics and so on is um, statistical in nature. And as for discreteness, well, that's what he thought he's just discovered, what he thought was his greatest discovery in 1905. It wasn't special relativity. It was that light is quantized. So the one he'd have to give up if he'd seen this argument is the principle that we can't affect the past. OK, now let's go back to, to, to the zigzag. Earlier, I noted two common objections to the retrocausal proposal. The, 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 the sort of, I don't know whether you really call that an objection. It's a response. Show me a model. Um, and the claim that retrocausality would imply retrosignaling, and that would lead to paradoxes. Um, my physicist friends tell me that this is the most influential kind of reason that people have for not considering retrocausality. They're just worried about the possibility of paradoxes. So if I could retrosignal, then I could warn my grandmother to a, a, avoid a, her unhappy marriage to my grandfather, and, and I'd never be born. But in fact, it's easy to use the kind of experiment we've just been considering to respond to both objections to show how to create a model, a very simple model, and to show that it can't be used for signaling. OK, but the first point is to show that, independently of quantum mechanics, it's very easy to show that causality doesn't imply the ability to signal. Um, here's a simple case. So what's happening here is that there's some device, say a, a coin flipper, which is producing a, a random series of bits, zeros and ones, which are coming into that device, but which Alice can't see. They're hidden from Alice's point of view. But Alice controls this device, which, when it's turned on, flips all the bits as they go through. So it turns the zeros into ones and the ones into zeros. And Alice has complete control over when that device is turned on. So she's obviously, Alice is obviously making a difference to the sequence of bits that's coming out. She's deciding whether it's, at any given stage, it's, it's the same sequence as is coming in or the opposite sequence. And yet, from Bob's point of view, it still looks like just a sequence of random bits. And so there's no way in which Alice can use her control of this device to send a signal to Bob. And so it, it's the combination of the hiddenness and the randomness which is doing the work. Obviously, if, if, if this wasn't a, a, a random series of bits, then it would be easy for Alice to, to modulate it, to impose a message on it using this device. Um, or if she could see the bits, then again, it would be easy for her to impose a message on it, say, by turning them all into ones to mean yes, or all into zeros to mean no. But as long as it's hidden and as long as it's random, we have causality without signaling. Um, OK, I've already said that. Now let's turn to the quantum case and show that we have it there too in simple, straightforward way. So this is actually the same experiment um, that I was talking about in the main section of the talk with these two polarizing crystals. Um, I've just drawn it this way on a space-time diagram um, to, to make the next step a little bit easier. But so here, here's Alice on the left-hand side of the experiment and Bob on the right-hand side. Now, if Alice controls the, the input channels here, um, then it's easy for her to control the polarization of a series of photons. Bob can detect that, not in the individual case, but, but statistically by performing a series of measurements. And so in that way, Alice can signal to Bob. 
But if the, if the input here is controlled by a demon, here I've, I've uh, given the demon a name, he's called Eratan to indicate that he's nature operating in reverse. In that case, um, it's just like the one on the previous slide of the, the, where the input is, is a, a random series of bits. Um, so in this case, Alice's choice makes a difference to the polarization, so there's causality, but she can't use it to signal. And effectively that's because, remember, she, she has control up to a, a factor of 90 degrees. Um, and from Bob's point of view, um, that corresponds to just the difference which prevents him from figuring out what the polarization choice is. Because from him, his point of view, it still looks like a, 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 a series of random bits. Okay, so here's a case using the experiment that, that we've described before, where we, again, have this feature of causality without signaling. And again, it's, it's, it's really because of the combination of randomness and, and hiddenness. Okay, now let's apply this to the case of Bell. What I've done here, just to explain the diagram, see, I, I've just taken that diagram and in effect tipped it backwards into the wall. And I've done that so that, to make it a bit more three-dimensional because I want to put that mirror on it at that point. In the mirror, what we see is a reflection of this half of the experiment. So, so here's the, the polarizing crystal again. Um, and, and here's the sort of mirror image of Alice, which I've called her Aquila. Um, and if you, if you think of this as, as a space-time diagram, then what you see, just as you see down here, you see Alice making a difference to the polarization, to, to the polarization of the photon after it leaves her polarizer. Here, in the mirror image version, you see Aquila making a difference to the, um, the polarization of the photon before it gets to her polarizer. And that difference makes exactly the same contribution to the explanation of the correlations in... I mean, if you just take that bit, what you've got there is a space-time diagram of, an EPR, of a Bell experiment. Uh, and the control that Aquila has here makes exactly the same contribution to the explanation of the correlations in that experiment as it does here. Uh, and that's no surprise. There's a, there's a very deep symmetry in, in, in the mathematics here, say in the path integral, um, which explains the fact that the, the pattern of correlations to be explained in that case, in that space-like case, is exactly the same as the pattern of correlations to be explained in that time-like case. Um, and all, all the mirror does here is really just to, to emphasize, to enable us to visualize this deep symmetry and to see how allowing Aquila control over something here will achieve exactly what allowing Alice control over something here does in explaining the correlations. In other words, it enables us to see exactly how the Parisian zigzag needs to work in this particular experiment. And once again, I, I called her, oh, yeah, okay, so she, she's not a Elika, she's Aquila. <laughs> Aquila can't signal to Bob for exactly the same reason that Alice can't signal to Bob. Um, and so, oh, and also, of course, we, we, don't, we don't need a demon in, in Aquila's case because nature just does naturally what the demon had to be assumed to do back here. Okay, so that's it. Um, that, that's how we can see that the Parisian zigzag doesn't enable us to signal to the past, and that's how we can see how simple the kind of model we actually need um, to implement it is. We, we, can, we can just get it by exploiting these simple symmetries in these experiments and taking that, the model that we assume to be in place in this ordinary time-like case and just flipping it over to apply it to the... Um, to the Bell case. Now, of course, if, if you've been thinking about symmetries carefully, you might object that so far this zigzag version of EPR is spatially asymmetric, and 
gender asymmetric as well because it's giving Aquila control but not giving Bob any control. But we can easily fix that by giving Bob exactly the same control as Aquila by making that spatially symmetric. And that's equivalent, obviously, to introducing the time symmetric control that um, the previous argument required um, for this kind of time-like experiment. Um, or that it required, assuming the um, realism of discreteness. So although the, the zigzag, Costa de Beauregard's zigzag, which was originally motivated by considerations of locality and experiments of that kind, and the new argument, which is motivated by considerations of time symmetry in experiments of this kind, although they're independent, they lead us to the same place in this elegant way. Okay, so just to sum up then, and I'm, I'm almost out of time. We've really got two arguments for the Paris option, for Costa de Beauregard's uh, suggestion. One comes from Bell's theorem, and we can see that by thinking about how Bell's theorem is usually formulated and then playing around with it a bit. So it's usually formulated as, as people will say that Bell showed that the assumption of locality together with the assumption, which is um, often called independence, which is effectively a no retrocausality assumption. Let's say Bell showed that, that those two assumptions lead to something, a prediction incompatible with quantum mechanics. Or in other words, quantum mechanics plus this no retrocausality assumption implies non-locality. That's how Bell's theorem is normally taken. And of course, non-locality is what we saw Schrodinger describing as magic. So in other words, just transposing, we could say that Bell's theorem shows that quantum mechanics plus the no magic assumption, that's locality, implies retrocausality. So Bell's theorem could have been taken as an argument for retrocausality right from the start. We saw that what prevented Bell from taking it that way was his worries about fatalism. And then this new argument that I've offered you with realism presupposed can be written like, written like this. Quantization, that's what gives us the discreteness assumption plus time symmetry. That also applies retrocausality. So we've got, we've got those two independent arguments leading to the same conclusion, leading to the conclusion that Costa de Beauregard was right, that there is retrocausality in the quantum world. I think it's also worth, worth putting, pointing out that, in effect, what we have here and here are, in some deep sense, also the same thing. I mean, the, the reason that, that Bell's theorem works in the quantum case but not in the classical case is also to do with what I was calling discreteness. Because you, 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 could, you could take a, a, an, an EPR-style experiment done with classical light, and of course you couldn't derive Bell's theorem in that case. Um, and that, that's because um, we haven't got quantization in the picture. So that's another way of emphasizing the fact that, that these two arguments, although in one sense independent, um, uh, the, the, they seem to have the same origin in quantum mechanics. And, the, and, the, and, and that origin is, in effect, quantization. Okay, that's it. Um, if any of you want to do any further reading, here's a couple of recent papers, one by me and one by me in conjunction with a couple of collaborators. Um, Ken Wharton is uh, a physicist from San Jose with whom I've been doing a lot of this work and, and Pete Evans was one of my graduate students in Sydney. Thank you.